Teresa anticipates the teaching of the Church on sacred scripture in the documents of the Vatican Council. She knew, as though by instinct, that since Holy Scripture must be read and interpreted according to the same, the same spirit by whom it was written, no less serious attention must be given to the content and to the unity of the whole of Scripture, if the meaning of the sacred texts is to be correctly brought to light. She strongly affirmed the basic necessity of believing in the truth and efficacy of God's words, which she said, cannot fail. Teresa's faith embraced the whole range of the scriptures, not just the parts that appeal to her. And importantly, this saved her from the fundamentalist view that would translate isolated passages into general rules. Having decided to follow certain advisors who were using Paul's words on the role of women in the church to dissuade her from making new foundations, Teresa then received contrary advice from the Lord himself. Tell them they should follow just one part of scripture, that they shouldn't follow just one part of scripture but that they should look at other parts and ask them if they can by chance tie my hands. Teresa was never content to be a mere spectator in the story of salvation as it unfolded in the scriptures. Eminently human and a person of prayer, she did not regard this Bible as a repertoire of sublime ideas and beautiful sentiments or as a collection of episodes remote from our own life. She was drawn into the drama, an actor in it. She wept with the Magdalene, she tells us, no more nor less than if she were being seeing Jesus with her own bodily eyes in the house of the Pharisee. She could likewise identify with the more active Martha and warned her Carmelite sisters about wanting to be Mary before having worked like Martha. The Samaritan woman was another of Teresa's special favourites. From the time I was a little child, she writes, I often begged the Lord to give me the water. I always carried with me a painting of this episode of the Lord at the well, with the words inscribed, Lord, give me to drink. Little wonder that John's Gospel seems to have been a Gospel especially dear to Teresa. In so many subtle ways, the fourth evangelist constantly invites the reader to be one with the leading character, and to enter with them into dialogue with Jesus. The gospel figure of the rich young man was also important for Teresa. He provided her with an embodiment of what she wished to teach us about a supremely important moment of transition in the life of prayer. We find her teaching in the third mansion of her interior castle, and she speaks of some upright and well-ordered people, inverted commas, well-balanced and virtuous persons of prayer, again in inverted commas. And she comments, from the time I began to speak of these dwelling places, I have had this young man in mind. For we are literally like him. Here, Teresa is warning us against a very subtle obstacle, a false security that impedes our final act of surrender in love, which would open us up to passive prayer. We are so circumspect, she says, regarding this state of the spiritual life, 
Let's abandon our reason and our fears into the Lord's hands. Reason is still very much in control. Love has not yet reached the point of overwhelming reason. By their fruits you shall know them. Teresa had pondered this gospel lesson well. Great contemplative that she was, she did not hesitate, however, to say of the highest state of prayer. This is the reason for prayer, my daughters, the purpose of this spiritual marriage, the birth always of good works, good works. Even from her younger years, she learned to be a doer and not merely a hearer of the word. She was only 16 and at boarding school when a nun there began to tell me, she writes, how she arrived at the decision to become a nun solely by reading what the scripture says. Many are called, but few are chosen. Therese again, recalling her school days, speaks of the strength the words of God, both heard and read, gave to my heart. Later in life, she would affirm her readiness to use all my strength to carry out the least part of the sacred scriptures. Teresa reminds us that the words of God are always efficacious, bringing into effect what they signify. They are both words and works, she tells us, and the source and spring of action. She tells us that occasionally she also heard interior words from the Lord, not with her bodily ears, but with the ears of her soul, in secret. Significantly, these words are linked with the words of Scripture, the truth of which is confirmed with greater clarity for Teresa by her own experience. Teresa describes the knowledge she experienced in a vision of the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity. She writes, Here all the three persons communicate themselves to the soul, speak to it, and explain these words of the Lord in the Gospel, that he and the Father and the Holy Spirit will come to dwell with the soul that loves him and keeps his commandments. These interior words were exceptional favours granted to Teresa later in her life. But the criterion for her was the truth that by their fruits you will know them. Whether of fortitude or gentleness, or light and quiet, but most importantly of all, their conformity to the word of God and the teaching of the church. The Vatican Council also tells us that prayer should accompany the reading of sacred scripture so that God and the person may talk together. For we speak to him when we pray, we hear him when we read the divine sayings. No wonder that Teresa, doctor of prayer, directs all those who in search of solid teaching on prayer to read the Gospels and focus our attention especially on the Our Father. This great prayer provided Teresa with a Gospel foundation for her own incomparable understanding of prayer. Teresa asserts, it is always good to base your prayer on prayers coming from the mouth of the Lord. I have always been fond of the words of the Gospels and found more recollection in them than in very cleverly written books. For her, the Our Father is not a rigid formula of prayer to be recited by rote as we heap up empty phrases. Her approach to praying it is eminently flexible. For Teresa, reciting the Our Father is like reading 
all the other words of sacred scripture. It is a kind of springboard or taking off point when we want to enter profoundly into the depths of silent prayer. We repeat it with a quiet rhythm and a lingering pace. We allow the words to sink into our hearts and be sparked into love by the spirit which breathes wherever it wills. She explains, I marvel to see that in so few words everything about contemplation and perfection is included. It seems to me we need to study no other book than this one. Up to now, the Lord has taught us the whole way of prayer and of high contemplation. Teresa's surrender to the demands of God's words was the fruit of a living faith in the mysteries of the Church and the person of Jesus. For her, the Word of God was Jesus, living and present here and now. Because of the Inquisition's index of forbidden books, she found herself deprived of so many of her favourite works that had provided her with the nourishment of the Word of God. But at this point, the Lord said to her, Don't be sad, for I shall give you a living book. Recalling these words, Therese explains, His Majesty had become the true book in which I saw the truth. Jesus is also the living presence that clasps our Carmelite rule into a marvellous unity. The rule challenges us at the outset to live a life of allegiance to Jesus Christ. And it reminds us, in conclusion, that our Lord at his second coming will reward anyone who does more than he is obliged to do. To discover the living presence of Jesus in our Carmenite rule is to read it as Teresa read the scriptures in a way so well described for us by Pope Benedict. Listening to Jesus in Lexio Divina, that is, reading sacred scripture in a non-academic, but spiritual way, we learn to encounter Jesus present, who is speaking to us. We must reason and reflect before him and with him on the words and actions of Jesus. The reading of sacred scripture is prayer. It must be prayer. It must emerge from prayer. And it must lead us 